every single thought regarding the Lord must be filtered through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How does that affect what you believe? How does it affect where you stand in your deliverance and in your freedom and in your provision and in your healing? How does it affect how you stand when you stand before the Lord? How does the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ affect you when you have sinned and you go back to Him? How does that affect you? Where are you in that position? Do you feel like you've been separated again? Or do you feel like, I'm just a dummy, I missed it again, what in the world was I thinking? And you go back and you know your God, your Father loves you, right? And that doesn't mean you have an excuse for sin. It's just that we know that we are saved and we are secure because it is written in the blood of Jesus. Amen? And it's not just a message of salvation. It's the gospel. It is everything. Jesus is everything. He has made unto us wisdom and sanctification and redemption. He is the living, breathing Word of God. Jesus is the logic of God having been manifested into humanity and walking around and showing us what God thinks of being human. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is not just the standard that you've got to live up to. He is God showing us what human life could be in, a, in one way. And then, of course, dying in our place because a, you know, sin had to be paid for in the body of the sinner. And there was none of us that could do it, right? So God laid down. And it's, this is a mystery that's hard to explain. And you've got to be careful how you talk about these kinds of things because people, they get nervous about when you talk about Jesus being a man. But we know from John chapter 17... Jesus prayed, I'm ready to take back the glory which I had before I came here. Amen. So he laid something down. Say something. something. That's a new word. You can take that home to South Africa. <laughs> something. That's S-U-M-P-I-N. Something. He laid something down because he needed to deliver humanity because we cannot do it in and of ourselves. And so you have to know that Him becoming human is an exchange for you. And now the life that we now live, we live by the faith of the Son of God. We live by His faith. We live by His Spirit. We live by His power. And that's the Christian life is to walk not by sight but by faith. Amen? And so we've been talking about this idea of faith in this message of um, a heart like God's. And faith being, faith is, listen, and I'm, I'm going to review a little bit just to get everybody kind of up to speed, but faith is not what you do to get God to respond to you. In other words, praying all night long, giving a bunch of money, you know, doing good works, stopping cussing, quitting drinking, those are not the things that you do to try to get God to then do something in your life, right? Those are things that can be affected by His Spirit living and working through you. But faith is, Jesus emptied Him, the Father, somehow God emptied Himself and became a human to die in our place, to deliver us from sin and death. And you look at that and you say, thank you, Jesus, that's faith. So faith is responding to what God has done in Christ. And then we see in Hebrews uh, 11, we see that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is evidence. And faith is a fact-finding mission. And there's a passage in there um, in Hebrews 11 about Sarah. If you put that up, please. Yeah, so we've, we've talked about this. Hebrews 11, 11. By faith, Sarah and Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who it was promised to that through him would come a child that would be a birth of a whole nation that would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's where we are. We are ultimately that nation through Abraham because of the Messiah, that nation that is to be a blessing to all the nations of the entire earth. Say, so that's me. So faith is this. By faith... Sarah herself also received strength to conceive. This is what you want to use your faith for. You respond to what God has done for you. You look to Jesus to clearly understand who He is, His heart for you. So then you go to things like Matthew 6 when you see Jesus talking about God's heart towards you. He says, do you see the birds of the air? 
Do you see the flowers of the field? Are they worried about being cared for and provided for? They're not storing things up. Are you of not much more value than they? You are much more valuable. And that's not to demean birds. You know what I'm saying? He's not like, ah, oh, those birds. <laughs> but you, really, you know. It, it's just making the point. It's like, no, 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 no. They're not worried out there. Don't you know that God loves you and cares for you and values you? And the way that he's going to show his value for you is to provide for you? And if you ever wonder, and I said this recently, but just walk outside and take a deep breath. And then become mindful that all of that free oxygen out there that God crafted for you to come into your body, it's just free out there. You can just walk out there and breathe as much of it as you want to, and it's not going to cost you a thing. And what does it do? It goes into your lungs. It assimilates into your bloodstream, which then nourishes your organs, which strengthens your immune system, which then goes throughout your body to be in the right chemical position to produce good, healthy hormones, to have good feelings, to have good thoughts, to make good decisions, to then use your body and your resources to be a blessing to other people and to glorify God, all because you walked out there and took a breath of all that free stuff floating around in the air out there. You got plenty to be thankful for. Amen? Honestly, if you ever wonder, is God my provider? So I've installed a trigger. You know, most of us have negative triggers. Trauma has happened to us. Things have happened to us. And we go, trigger. You know, a trigger is you hear a sound and you put your back in the hospital room. Or, or you hear a song and you're at your wedding again. Or whatever it is. You know, you just go there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You guys have triggers? I would ask you what your triggers are, but some of you might have meltdowns in the moment. And we're... <laughs> I have intentionally installed a trigger, and one of my triggers is this. When I see and hear birds, I think this. God is moving heaven and earth to provide for me. Every time I walk out and I hear a bird and see a bird, that's what I start to think. And it's sometimes I'll be sitting inside and I'll, I'll just look outside and I'll start to think, He's moving heaven and earth to provide for me. Because that's what Jesus said. Do you not see the birds? And he used that as a proof that he wants to provide for you. So good. Because you're so, so valuable to him. Amen? You believe that? Yeah. I mean, do you actually really believe that? Yeah. I hope that that is how you build your theology is based on what Jesus said. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. Especially how you see yourself. Now, you can take that and pervert that into selfishness and dream about giant mansions and big driveways and pools and vacations or whatever, you know, the, the, the selfish, immature stuff. You can go there with it, but that's not what we're talking about. Nobody, you know, I mean, a, a, a genuine adult, mature, full-grown believer is not seeking for material gain, right? God wants you to be blessed. He's cool with it. I mean, he made a planet for two people, and it's beautiful. God is into extravagance but so that you would be blessed to be a blessing. That's right. Amen? So faith is not, oh, what have I done wrong? Ah, let me see if I can figure out what I got to do. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I sure didn't do that. No, God, give me more faith so I can do that. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not what faith is. Faith is Jesus walking in the room, standing in front of you, pointing right at you into your nose. <laughs> And saying, I died for you, I love you, you are forgiven. And then you look at him and you say, yes, sir. That's faith. The yes, sir is the faith. The response is the faith. And then that sparks this whole spiritual chain of the kingdom inside of you increasing. And the leaven of the kingdom on the inside of you folding into every aspect of your life because you've seen Jesus rightly. And that's what we want to do. We want to see Jesus rightly. And it takes you seeing his value for you to see him rightly. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Because uh, we've got work to do on this planet to represent him. And you know, we're not trying to figure out how to get him to forgive us. We're not trying to figure out how to get him to show up and do things for us. No, it's a completely opposite. It's like, no, I've got all the resources that I might. I'm blessed 
I, you know, he's, he's, all his promises are yes and amen. He's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given me a new heart. He's put his spirit on the inside of me. He's given me his word. His spirit is in me, reminding me that I'm his child. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is giving life to my physical body. Amen. And then he puts us in churches together where people come and give us words and encouragement and teach us and remind us. And we get to build each other up. What are we doing? Why are you worrying? I just heard this illustration, and I'm not going to say who it is. But they were talking about how things going on with their kids, and it's like you have something going on with your kids, and the next thing you know, you're 20 years in the future with problems about your young children. And they didn't say this, but I'm going to add to it. How many of you have children or maybe a pain in your toe and the next thing you know, it's cancer, you're planning your funeral, and you're worried about what your children are going to grow up without a parent, right? Or maybe your kids have this problem and you think they're never going to get over this, and that means I'm going to have to do this, and we've got to do this, and we're going to have to do this, and next thing... It, you're 20 years into the future destroying the hope that you could have for them where you could turn it around and be 20 years into the future of dreaming the promises of God for them. Yes. Which one do you want to be putting into your heart? because that's building an expectation. I'm not trying to make fun of you. But it's, it's powerful, isn't it? You ever planned your own funeral because you had a pain in your body? There more, more people than we realize have done that, I'm telling you. I was having some issues one time. Turned out to be just really bad <laughs> indigestion. And I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I was going to die. I thought, I was gonna, I thought Sarah was going to wake up next to me and find me dead laying in the bed. And, you know, so I prayed. I'm like, Lord, how do I, what do I do? And he just gave me a couple of dietary suggestions, and I did them. And it went away. Praise God, right? It didn't have to be some miraculous thing. It was just, eh, you probably should do this. Anyway, so we're in this place of, all right, we want to build faith. But, we want, but building faith is being stronger at responding to Him, right? Great faith, weak faith, little faith is not, I've got more of something. It's that, no, I'm more convinced of who, I'm more convinced of who God is now than I ever have been. Amen. That's increasing faith. Are you with me? That's what you want to do. You want to use the Word of God to put it into your mind and into your heart to build your capacity to respond to God. Because Jesus teaches us in Matthew uh, 13, Mark, anybody do your homework? Mark 4, Matthew 13, I gave you some homework last week. I'll give you more homework this week. Do your homework from last week. <laughs> but honestly, uh, I'll just give you ahead of, uh, ahead of time. Your homework for this week is read Galatians. It's only six chapters, you can do it quickly. Read it because it'll expound on what we're talking about today. So your role is this, guard your heart. Say, guard your, guard your heart. Yeah. So what does that mean? All right. So we've been talking about this. Would you put up the Ezekiel passage? We've been talking about this idea. Uh, unfortunately, when we talk about the heart in the church, most people say, well, the heart's wicked and deceitful and you can't trust it. And it's like, well, the old one was, but you got a new one. So you have a new heart. A new heart. Am I talking too fast? Ezekiel 36, 26, this is a pro to me, it's one of the most beautiful prophecies about the new covenant. I will give you a new heart, say new heart, new heart. and put a new spirit, say new spirit, new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, just a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So leave it on that for just a moment. You will, because you've given, been given a new heart. And so for a couple of weeks, we talked about the idea of heart transplants, like an actual heart transplant. Remember those stories? Just quickly, physical heart transplant stories are incredible, like actual surgeries where someone passes away and they're an organ donor and they've donated their heart and someone that needs a new heart is the recipient and they go undergo a surgery and now they have a new heart. Uh, it's a thing. I mean, and we, we all know that. But did you know that there's a phenomenon where the recipient of a donated heart many times starts having the feelings and the desires and the thoughts 
of the person whose heart they have. And, you know, things like craving new kinds of foods, enjoying football when they never did before, liking a certain kind of music that they never even liked before, desiring to be fit and exercise, because they've gotten a new heart and then they speak to the donor's family and they realize oh, and you, you're desiring the things and doing the things that our deceased loved one did. Now, it's an interesting thing because they say, it's like it's happening within me. I, I can't even control it. I don't even, I don't even know how it's happening. And in fact, it's so strong within them. Oftentimes, many heart recipients will say, it feels like there's somebody else living on the inside of me because I've got these things. And sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. One, one guy got the heart of, a, of someone and then fell in love with the spouse of the donor. That's pretty powerful. So you, so, and we know now that your physical heart has neurons, which means it has a cap capability of thinking and remembering. And there's some study to show that your short-term memory is more processed in your brain and your long-term memory is more processed in your heart. It's not that cut and dry, but there's some, some nuance to that. So here's the thing. What if you had to give someone your physical heart. What's in it? What have you spent your lifetime doing and thinking and believing and all of the stuff that is getting programmed into the neurons of your heart and then you got to give your heart and then they then start wanting the things that you desire now. Would you want that for them? Y'all are looking at me funny. I, th I think I'm going to need a 9-volt battery, Chris. Will you grab me one, please? Think about that, though. What if you gave your heart to someone and then they started becoming like you? Do you want that? So what are you going to do about that? Guard it. Guard it. Amen. Good answer. You get an A. So hold that thought. And mom says, double woohoo. <laughs> God gave you a new heart. It's programmed to keep his statutes. I will cause you to keep my judgments and do them. Here's the thing. Now, it's actually natural for you to want to do the things that God would lead you to do. This is why we have to renew our minds so that there's not a conflict. This is why we have to do all the Christian stuff that we do is to get our mind in alignment with the spirit of the living God on the inside of us and our heart is not being pulled back and forth in the process. And now when he says, I'll give you a new heart, it's interesting the Hebrew uses the word for the physical heart, but we know that it's some type of spiritual thing because in, in Colossians 2, and we talk about this a lot, but I'm just telling you, I want you to get this stuff. In Colossians 2, there's a spiritual circumcision that happens where he removes the body of the sins of the flesh and puts in a new heart. It's like an inner man, a new core. The old core gets removed and the new core gets put in. And that body of the sins of the flesh is the word sarx, which typically means flesh, and it has two meanings. One is this skin. Do this. This is, say, this is sarx. Don't hit each other now. You know. It's not your opportunity, but this is Sark's. The other definition is the mere human nature that was opposed to God and prone to sin. That was removed. And you got a new heart that is programmed to obey God. Is that not powerful? I don't think this is a stretch here what we're talking about. Guard that space. Because that heart, would you put up the graphic? This is, oh, oh, sorry, there's one more passage in the Galatians passage about, I can jump back here too. It's just a single passage. Yeah, here. God has, set, God has sent His Spirit into your heart. Say that except, say, it, say this. God has sent His Spirit into my heart. Ready, go. You believe that? 
But do you actually believe that? Yes. Now, what does that mean? Now you can put the graphic up if you would, please. So this is, this is a graphic that, you know, I don't think, I, I mean, obviously I've showed it in this series, but this is something that we, that I, I you know, it helps me understand some things and it's something that illustrates it. It would be impossible to like perfectly illustrate what we are, <laughs> you know, David prays, what is man that you're mindful of him? Well, we're not three circles, but it's a visual representation. And so today I want to land on this idea of sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. In other words, guarding the heart to protect the place. See, the heart is this space where the word gets put into. Hebrews 4.12, uh, you know, the, the word of God is alive and sharp and powerful and piercing, sharper than a two-edged sword. And it goes between joints and marrow and it gets down and it's a discerner of the intents and the thoughts of the heart. It gets down in there. The Word of God is what's inside of you that then starts to change. And we're not just talking about the rhema, like the, word, like the understanding of, of the Word or just the written Word or just the spoken Word. We're talking about the living Word. We're talking about the logos. We're talking about that which is Jesus, right? So in the beginning was the Word, the logos. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. The Word became a human. And, but now still that Word gets planted on the inside of your heart. It's alive. It's living. There's a spiritual energetic to the Word of God. So when you're, when you're reading Scripture, what you're doing is you're reading about a life force that's in you that's powerful. It's like reading a science book about electricity. If you just read about what you, we got an electrician, you could probably tell us. But if, if you just read about electricity, it's like, oh, I understand electricity. But you go out there and you start putting wires together and you start putting a, a load on and you see what electricity can do. It's a totally different thing. It's like it becomes alive and active. Is it true that we don't even really know what electricity is? It like just, it like travels down these, but they don't even really know what it is. It's a mystery, it's a mystery. yeah, from an electrician. It's kind of like the kingdom working in us. It's a mystery, but it works. Say, it works. it works. So, are you ready? Because I want to talk about something, and we might, I'm going to dig a little bit here, but I just want you to see this, and this is very powerful. I'm going to read a few passages, but I, I, w I would love for you to go and read all of Galatians this week. If you've never read it, you're going to love it, especially chapter 3. But read the whole thing in context of what we're talking about here. So, Galatians is this idea... Well, let me, just, let me just say before this, this is what you want to guard. The spirit of the living God is on the inside of you. You know, God has joined himself to you, and that is the place where life is emanating out into the rest of your being. We're not, we're not in our bodies, which by the way, the body is made of flesh, but it's not the flesh that we're about to talk about. I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit more. But in this place, this is where you need God, is on the inside of you. You know, too many believers are praying, God, show up and do this thing externally, and God, make this happen and move this over here and move that over there. And it's like, no. Even if God were to move that over there, but you weren't moved inwardly to be able to step into that thing that He created, that opportunity for you, it would just, you, you wouldn't even recognize it. I, this is, listen, I'm telling you. There are things that God has inspired people to move around and create opportunities for you. And maybe they knew, maybe they didn't. And I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm just talking about them yielding themselves to be a blessing to you. And because where you were in your heart, you either didn't recognize it or you just couldn't step into it and receive it. I dare say it's probably millions of times that that's happened throughout our lifetime, that God has sought to move us into something that He's prepared for. And where, either the way we see ourselves or we ruled out the opportunity, our, mi our mind wasn't in line with His logic and we couldn't step into it. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just saying there's, the, the point of that is there's limitless opportunities to follow God. And you're hardwired to follow Him now as you know who you are in Him. So I want to talk about this idea of sowing to the flesh 
versus sowing to the Spirit. But let me make this point. When we talk about flesh, we're not talking about this body. You, you, anybody familiar with Gnosticism at all? We, you know, I've talked about it a little bit. Some of you have probably done some reading on it. This is kind of a crude summary, but Gnosticism was an idea that crept into the early church. Gnostic, the, a Gnostic belief is that really at its core is that the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God. And there's different iterations, but they would say that the Old Testament God was mean and vengeful and judgmental. But one of the things that gets adopted, that got adopted into the New Covenant Church is this idea that everything that's physical is evil and everything that's spiritual is good. And some people use that to say, well, it doesn't really matter what we do in our bodies because it's just evil and it's just going to pass away and we're going to transcend the body and we can just transcend into heaven and we're good with God. Well, that's unwise. That will bring you to an early grave and might even harden your heart to where you reject salvation. Be careful. Don't harden your heart. Uh, so the idea when we go through about what we're about to talk about the idea of flesh is not necessarily doing physical acts. It's talking about putting on the old mindset of who you used to be. Flesh not meaning, because it's going to talk about the desires of the flesh. And unfortunately, a lot of preaching would make you think it's talking about your physical desires of your body, which it, sounds, it makes it sound like, if you don't understand, my body is evil and I've got to fight my physical cravings. And that's just not true. God made your body. He made it with a healthy desire for food. He made it to have a healthy uh, sex drive. He made it to have healthy desire for relationships, healthy engagement with the world around you. Your physical desires are not inherently evil. They only become perverted when in your mind you desire an ungodly fulfillment of it, and then it programs into your physical body, and then you become accustomed to craving something that's ungodly, destructive, sinful. Are you with me? So if you yield your mind to who you are in Christ and you desire righteousness, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you recognize that you have been made holy, you serve your heart up to serve Him. You don't yield your members to the opportunity for, for sin, right? You'll crave. Your physical body will not allow you to crave a perverted version of sex, a perverted version of what it looks like to be in a relationship. You literally can renew your mind with the Word of God of who you are in Christ to the degree that you desire godly things naturally. Amen? Amen? Amen. You can be free from sin. Yeah. That's good. You believe that? Yeah. You really can. And we're not, I'm not trying to boil this down to a science equation where it's like, now I've got I to do this in my mind, I've got to do this in my heart, and I've got to do this, and I can be this. No, no, no. We're just talking about different wording for the idea of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right. What does transformation mean? Well, there's a physical aspect to that. And I think we can understand those things. You know, we understand that thoughts create patterns in your thinking, your, your, the chemistry of your brain, the electrical activity of your brain, you think repetitive thoughts, that's going to get wired in there. You can think new repetitive thoughts and rewire them. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, therapy based on that kind of thing. Now, you don't want to lend on just that because what you want to use to renew the mind is the living Word of God, the Logos, right? We're not just talking about power, positive thinking. We're not just talking about sitting down and imagining a beautiful future for yourself. It's the Word of God. Say, Word of God. Word of God. So, are you all ready? I love this. And just pray for me that I say it the right way. <laughs> all right, so this is Galatians 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. How do you not lose heart? Don't grow weary in well-doing. Now, keep in mind we're talking about well-doing. I'll give you the end from the beginning. The well-doing is doing good toward one another. So I'll just tell you what he's doing is he's framing the idea of sowing to the flesh and sowing to the spirit based on the idea of how we treat people. Now, there is the issue of dealing with personal sins that are in time. I mean, you know, if you're sitting in a hotel room by yourself smoking crack, watching porn, you need to deal with that. 
I mean, that might be a little specific. <laughs> However, and obviously, we're not talking about making, you know, creating a license for centering that kind of stuff. But what he's framing that, so you got to realize that, that this culture that they were in, I mean, they legitimately had temple prostitutes that they could go down and have sex with to try to honor uh, Aphrodite, the goddess, which was probably a demon god back from the Nephilim and giant days. I'm going to go out there for a minute. But, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, but it still does relate to us today. Say, keep reading. Keep reading. Okay, that's a good idea. I'll do that. So. <laughs> Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Let us do good to all. This is what I want you to think of. It's very basic, very simple. If you want to guard your heart, see, because we're talking about the idea that your responsibility, guard your heart. You got God on the inside of there. You got a new heart. The word's in there trying to bear fruit. What causes it to not bear fruit is the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, fear, worry, anxiety. Then it gets into the perversion and all that stuff. Sin hardens your heart. Guard your heart. Say, guard your heart. Guard your heart. And faith is, I'm going to intentionally gather evidence from my life and from the Word of God to put into my heart to build faith. This is guarding your heart. And this is another way to guard your heart. Do good to all. Say, do good to all. Do good to all. Doing good to all gets you out of yourself because what it does is, is it, it wires you to walk in love toward one another. And that, that's kind of a big arc and umbrella of what we're talking about in this series, a heart like God's. But we're talking about cultivating faith, hope, and love. And hope being the confident expectation of good things. You know? So once you've taken the time to sow the word, then you go to hope. You've taken the time to build faith in your heart. In other words, respond to God. Then you go to hope, which is a confident expectation of good things. I've put the faith on. I've, put, I've sown the word. Now I'm going to stand in hope, which is I'm going to expect it to actually bear fruit. And, and now I want to kind of transition into walking in love. Uh, so therefore, we have, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Interesting. Next one, please. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom in an, into an opportunity of the flesh. Don't sin. Uh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In this statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor. So you see the context? Do good to all. Yes, walk in and keep the law, keep the commandments of God, but it's all boiled down into this one thing. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? See, now the commandments of God are not for righteousness. Really, they never were. Did you know that? The law was never given so that you could keep them and then be righteous. It can't do that. You know, how many of you have ever been pulled over by a police officer and they gave you a reward for driving the speed limit? It's just not what the law does. The law points out where you missed it. So that you can, and, and the law that we had was to point it out to the degree that we've missed it to the core of what we are deserving hell because we rebelled against God. So the law was never meant to bring you to a place of right. Don't ever let somebody make you think that you doing enough good th things as you're, I can't even say, it, I get choked up with it. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, let's keep going. So, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the state, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, twice there's a context, do good to all, love your neighbor as yourself. This is what we're talking about. Uh, but, if you bite and devour one another, again, now he's flipping it, but we're still talking about how we relate to each other. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. Now, let's keep going. We're talking about sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit, guarding your heart. So, but I say walk by the Spirit, all right? Keep the context on, loving, doing good to all, loving people, not devouring one another, relationship, how we treat one another. This is the context. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Okay, flesh, remember? Are we talking about the body here? 
Some people think that. Some people think that, well, we can't trust our body. We've got to subdue the flesh and we've got to crucify the body and we just can't give in to these desires. and We've got to whip, whip and we've got to fast because my body is craving evil because we're evil. Well, you know what? Stop being Gnostic. <laughs> if your body is desiring, if you feel like you have natural cravings in your body for sinful things, I know what you've been thinking about. Do you? Like, are you actually willing to take the time to evaluate where your thoughts are and how you think about certain things that have then become physical things within your body that drive you to other things, 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 things? You ever hear yourself talking? You're like, why am I saying that word so many times? The flesh is the old man, but it's dead. Say it's dead. The flesh is the old way of thinking. The flesh is who you were before you were made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, you can still think that way, but it will lead you to death and destruction. So that, that, that contextualizes what we're really talking about here. We're not talking... Okay, so... For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Go, go back to... Let's go back. Let's see. Just keep this in mind, the spirit against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. But don't look at the body. Look more so with the head, with the brain there. The flesh is there. So you might have a desire for uh, food or provision or some kind of sexual thing rise up on the inside of you. Where are you going to go with it? Are you going to then respond to that desire by sowing to the spirit or are you going to sow into the flesh? Are you going to then lust after someone else or make a decision that's ungodly? Or are you going to somehow sow back into the Spirit and let God be the fulfillment of that thing for you? And the Holy Spirit is in you to give you self-control. And, and help you renew your mind so that you don't pervert. See, because you'll have this natural desire come up out of your body, but where you are in your mind, make, make it crooked. Okay, I'm feeling that. That means party. Woo! Or I'm feeling that. That means I'm going to go pray that God brings me a spouse quickly. I mean, are we being real or not? Let's go back to the one we were at. So for the desire, so the desire, you could say the desire to be, to drag up the dead man and live the way I used to is against the spirit. And the spirits against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, manipulation, you could say, with witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions or divisions, factions, us against them, uh, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and, thing, and, and, uh, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice, say practice, practice, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you have been jealous since you've been saved. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have been drunk since you've been saved? How many of you have ever had an us against them mentality since you've been saved? If you think that you haven't, let me ask you about your political beliefs. It's sin. Did you realize that? Carousing is orgies. How many of you have? <laughs> Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom. Now, does that mean, since you were jealous, that you're not saved? Because no. some people think that. They'll read this and they think it's a matter of salvation. A couple of key things here. It's the word practice. So in other words, if that's your lifestyle if you are making plans 
to go out and be drunk and engage in sexual immorality, oh, you need to check your heart. If you find yourself and you're under pressure and you're under stress, you make a mistake, it's like, oh, again, why am I messing with this? I don't, I don't want to go there. That's not practicing it. Now, let me ask you this. Does that make you want to go sin? Does that make you feel like, oh, thankfully now I can, now I've got a light, now I've, I've got permission to, Clint gave me permission to sin. I mean, you know, let's just grow up. People that hear that, it's like, really? Come on. When you read something like this, it may or may not be a matter of salvation. I don't think it's a matter of salvation. I think it's a matter of experiencing the fruit of the Spirit of the living God in this earth, in this life. If you think it is a matter of salvation, I'll ask you again. Have you been jealous? Have you, had, have you ever been angry towards someone? Are you not saved? I'm not going to try to button that up. I'm just saying, think about that. And because then in 1 John 2, Paul say, or John says, uh, Dear little children, don't sin. But if you do, remember, Jesus Christ is your advocate with the Father. Now, do you hear John saying, ah, just go ahead and sin. Is that what you hear? Don't sin. But if you do, remember Jesus already paid for it. That's essentially what he's saying. If you sin, if you find yourself having stumbled and made a mistake, remember, repent, confess. All of that stuff, go back to Jesus and remember, remember, he's already paid for it. Now, some will hear, ooh, be careful, people are going to use that as a license to sin. What are we going to do? Take that scripture out of the Bible? In fact, what I think it should do to a well-intended person is make them realize, okay, yeah, all right, I get it. I, I don't want to sow to the flesh. I don't want to continue in this lifestyle. I do know that the grace of the living God is on the inside of me to live free from this. I don't want, I don't want that in my life, but thank God I am saved. And that actually is the power to receive the strength to walk above the power of it in your life. Knowing that you're forgiven. Knowing that you are accepted by God. If you hear that you're forgiven and accepted and think, woo, let's go, party. Uh, you know, come talk to me. I'll smack you around a little bit, tell you to grow up, and we'll figure it out. Amen. Next, so it's talking about practicing. Last verse. But the fruit of the Spirit, and again, toward one another, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, like, if you're struggling, you can literally sit and expect patience to rise up on the inside of you. It's like the Spirit is inside of there to be the power of patience to rise up in you and so that you become... How many of you have ever been angry and then you stopped, you took a deep breath, you prayed, and then it shifted toward love toward someone? You ever done that? I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about where the rubber meets the road really more so even how you live towards yourself. But what he's talking about is he's framing it of, in how we treat one another. You know, the, the, the sin that you need to deal with is the sin that is private, but it's also the sin that is t toward other people. The lust, the strife, the jealousy, the backbiting, the, you know, you ever have conversations and you've talked about somebody and you walk away and you feel like you got gravel in your mouth or something like that? You know, you're just like, Oof, I don't know, yeah. nobody. <laughs> gravel, that didn't make sense. Sowing to the Spirit is intentionally doing good toward others and intentionally seeking to love others as Christ has loved you. That is sowing to the Spirit. That's guarding the, the heart. And when you can arrest yourself in the moment, when you are tempted to go into something that is ungodly, as you trust God, you, you expect these to rise up on the inside of you. This is what you need. This will feed you. This is the fruit. It's like you pick this off of the tree of life, of the Spirit of God inside of you, and you eat the fruit of patience, kindness, gentleness, 
goodness, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Say self-control. Self Say, I can control myself with God's help. You believe that? Against such, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Again, we're not just talking about your body. We're not Gnostics. We're talking about the old way of thinking, the old thoughts, the logic that we think that when it's Friday, it's time. Let's get it on. You know what I mean? That way of thinking is flesh. And you think that way, and then guess what your body's going to want? So, um, and it's desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. Let's not become boast boastful, uh, challenging one another. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Next one, please. Oh, is that the last one? I think we're missing one. But he brings it down to this, doing good toward all. We'll go back to that as the closer here. Find that for me, the one that says doing good toward all. He frames the whole thing in this idea. You want to glorify and honor God? Walk in the fruits of the Spirit. You want to walk in the fruits of the Spirit? You got to sow to the Spirit. Don't sow to the flesh. And sowing to the flesh is making sure that you're intentionally walking in love toward people and seeking to do good toward one another, thereby guarding your heart. I'm just telling you, when you want to be walking in love toward people, intentionally doing good toward one another, you're going to protect yourself against the desire for sin. It's just, there's just a mechanism on the inside of you that when you desire intentionally, I want to walk in love toward this person. And if you've got an opportunity, think about this. The next time you're tempted, the next time you're tempted, if you'll do this, if you will think, who in my life needs ministry right now? It will cause a shockwave to go through you, maybe a little bit of embarrassment, maybe a little bit of guilt and shame. Not, we're not after that. But if the next time you're tempted, but then you think, who is it in my life that needs ministry? And you start praying for them. It's amazing how it will just change what's going on on the inside of you. Seeking to do good toward others and seeking to love others as Christ has loved you. Amen. Amen? And it's just the difference between carnal thinking and spiritual thinking, Amen. which leads to life or leads to death. Carnal thinking being all of this stuff of the desires of the flesh. So, get your head right. Say, I'll get my head right. I'll get my heart right. It naturally wants to follow God. And I want to glorify God and honor God. And He will help me. Amen. Let's stand up. Put your attention on Him. Father, we trust You. We love You. We thank You that You've delivered us. We have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of Your dear Son. Father, we thank You that You have stripped every evil spirit of any authority. You have it all. Say, Jesus has all authority. Darkness cannot come near my dwelling. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I can walk in you. The power of your spirit's on the inside of me. Now, I just want you very, very simply, in your mind and in your heart, you're making the decision, I'm going to do good toward all. And just see yourself. Just see yourself wake up in the morning. And whoever is the first person that you encounter... What is it that you can do good toward them? How can you love that person? And then the next people. Put yourself in your job surrounding. And you do have an imagination. You can use it. If you have conflict with people at your job, see yourself in that position and see yourself being kind to them. See yourself being patient with them. Seeing yourself willingly love them. See, because here's the deal. We are to walk in love toward one another. Well, let me ask you this. Did Jesus ever say to his disciples, I love you? It's really not there. But what did he do? He showed kindness. He showed compassion. He showed mercy. He showed his love. He didn't just say it. He actually showed it. 
people are starving for love. There's no greater thing to open someone's heart to hear the gospel than you choosing to do good toward them, no matter what they've done toward you. It's really one of the most simple things. I mean, we may have talked about some complicated ideas, but it's down to one idea. How are we going to treat people? Because the world out there needs to know Jesus. They don't know. They don't know. And if they've heard of him, they don't know how good he is, and they don't know how he cares about them. And you get to be the one that shows them the value that God has for them. Are you with me? And you're programming that into your heart to naturally desire and want to do those things. Guard your heart. We're disciples, are we not? We are to discipline ourselves after his principles, after his statutes, not to try to be accepted, not for fear that we're going to be rejected, but because we want to represent him. So Jesus, we worship you. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey.
Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources, available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbyers.com.